Okay, so the, the good news is I don't have any more information to cram into your brain. Okay, so what we're going to talk about now is some presents that we want to give you. Okay, so this relates to the envelope that you should have picked up when you came in and some uh, glass test tubes that we will give to all of the um, doctors from township hospitals. So within the blue envelope that hopefully you've all picked up on the way in, you'll find a number of things. One is this little four page booklet, which is a guide to snake bite assessment. Um, within it, uh, there is a diagnosis algorithm, an administration of antivenom algorithm. On the front page, there is a guide to history and examination points of, of relevance. And on the back, there is a snake bite identification aid and a guide to some clinically significant issues for you to think about. There is also a referral letter to be used when you transfer a patient from your hospital to Mandalay General or another institution. We also have in that folder a one page guide to remind everybody how to do the whole blood clotting time so that we are all doing it the same way. At the back of the room there are some folders, laminated folders that you are free to take and we would encourage you to take to put in your hospitals if, um, as a reminder of the, the protocol so that you have that at hand. Now the intention of these documents, the project would like eventually these documents to be available within every hospital in the region. Um, within Mandalay General what we will be doing is putting the wall posters up in the ERC and when a patient with snake bite arrives in the hospital, uh, the doctor who is seeing the patient in the ERC will be given this booklet so that when they see the patient they have all this information in their hand and they can look at the patient and they can look at the booklet and all the information is there for them to see. Now what we would like and hope is that all of the doctors from the township hospital will do something similar and will put those booklets in a place where they can access them when a patient with snake bite comes to your hospital. Um, we have given um, around three copies I think of, of that booklet to each of you and a copy of the referral letter. Um, obviously that won't last you very long. So Dr Nyan Nyan Chit, um, who's at the back of the room there, um, is going to be coordinating resupply of those documents once you need some more. Okay, so she's the lady to contact if you would like more copies of those documents. She will tell us, we will print them and give them to you. Okay, we are also going to be supplying each of the township hospitals with um, glass test tubes to be used for the whole blood clotting time. And Chanao is holding a, a, a little pallet of glass test tubes here. So what we would encourage you to do is for each township hospital to take one of those little pallets with you when you leave so that you can use those disposable glass test tubes to do your whole blood clotting times with. Um, when you run out, again, get in contact with Nyan Nyan Chit and she will um, coordinate resupply of those. Because we would like everybody in the region to be doing the whole blood clotting time the same way as we have shown you in the video, as it is described in the one page that you have in your booklet there, using these disposable glass tubes that we are going to provide you with. Okay. Um, now what I would like to do now is just to walk through the document with you so that you know that what it does um, and understand what it is that we are trying to achieve with it. The intention of this document is to make information on how to assess and manage a snake bite available to every doctor everywhere in the region. Okay? It's very important that a doctor in Mandalay and a doctor in each of the townships has access to the same information and that we're all making decisions using your national protocol. And that as much as is possible, patients are receiving a standardised care everywhere within this region. We would also like, by standardising approach to history and examination and recording of that information and transfer of information between institutions to improve 
what is recorded in your patient's notes and hospital data and what is transferred with patients from one institution to another. Um, this will have a number of effects. If we can capture more information, capture good information in patient notes and referral letters, then we can look at that information and analyse that information and give you information about outcomes, what components of patient care work and do not work, and we can start to analyse what is happening to the patients in this region in terms of their treatment and their outcomes. Okay. So this document, this is the first page of the guide to snake bite assessment and I'm not sure how clearly that actually projects but you do have a copy in your hand. So what this document, the first page of the document does is set out what we think is important information in terms of the history, examination, clotting assessment, antivenom use and other treatments given at your hospital. And within that first page of the document we take you through step by step what we think it is very important for the doctor to ask the patient and very important for the doctor to record in the patient's notes. And it is simple things, it is the age and gender, what the time of the bite was, when the patient arrived at your hospital, where did the bite occur in terms of the nearest village and this will allow us to look to see if there is a regional variation in the severity of snake bite or the responsiveness to antivenom for example. What the patient was doing when the patient was bitten, how many times the patient was bitten, whether the snake was actually definitely seen or not, because uh, often I think some of patients come to your hospitals and they say it was Russell's Viper, Russell's Viper. Maybe they didn't see the snake, but because Russell's Viper is so common, I think some patients assume if they are bitten it was Russell's Viper. So asking, did you see the snake? What did it look like? Did it look like this one? It's important. We ask you to record ask and record if first aid was started and what type of first aid was started, did the patient see a traditional healer or not and did the patient receive any medical treatment before they came to your hospital and has the patient got any relevant past medical history. The things we're most interested in to be honest are does the patient have pre-existing kidney disease, do they have pre-existing cardiac disease and have they been bitten by a snake before because those three things are important to the patient's response to the snake bite and the patient's response to the antivenom treatment that you'll be giving them. We then just remind you in point two, the examination of the important things to look at and to look for. So you must examine the bite site and the draining regions, looking for swelling and lymphadenopathy. You must examine for coagulopathy. Um, and capillary leak and neurotoxicity and shock. So the things we talked about before in the assessment and management lecture, there's just a little prompt here to make sure that you remember those when you're looking at the patient in front of you. Point three, we ask that you do a clotting assessment, obviously, and that you record the results of those clotting assessments serially so that you can see what is happening over time. And the easiest way to do that really is if you make a little table, a little chart in the patient's notes so you can see what is happening to the results over time. It's obviously very important that if the patient receives antivenom that you record the time and the dose and what type of antivenom you have given and what the response to that was, both in terms of complications or a positive outcome, so that we can try and assess whether there is um, an effective treatment in place. And we would also ask that you record any other treatments that were given, specifically fluids, how much, what type of fluid, did you give a diuretic? Because we need to try and assess the volume status of the fluids and this has come up again and again throughout the course of today. So that's page one. It is basically just a reminder of the important things to ask, look for and record in your patient's notes. Now the second page is probably the thing that is going to be of most use to people. This is your protocol, the Myanmar protocol for the assessment and management of snake bite. Um, and basically all we've done is turn it into a pretty picture. Um, so this is not something that we have generated, this is a representation of lots of work by um, Tunpei and, and Kintida Twin and, and many physicians in your country um, that we have uh, put into this format to make available to you. And what I would like to do is just to walk through that document now so that you understand how it is intended to work and understand it. 
So what we do, the patient comes through your door and has been bitten by a snake. I don't have a pointer, but so we start at the top. Whoop. Snake bite occurs and turns up to your hospital. The first thing that should be done is first aid should be applied and the patient should be transferred to a health facility. The next thing that should be done is resuscitative care. So this is making sure that the patient has a patent airway, is breathing okay, and that you have addressed shock if it's present. Then the question is which antivenom to give. So the first question to ask is, is the snake that caused the bite available or can it be identified? Now if it can, yes it is. Okay, we do know what snake it was. Was it a Russell's Viper? Yes it was. So then the next question you need to ask on initial assessment is, is there an immediate indication for antivenom? So is there non-clotting blood or shock or kidney failure or severe local swelling? Now if there is, now these things are all obviously indications for antivenom. Follow the arrow down, start treatment. Give antivenom and it tells you what dose to give. Eight vials of MPF. Okay. If you do know what the snake is, yes, I do know what it is. It is a um, Russell's Viper, but none of these things apply. There is no immediate indication to give antivenom. And you come down to this box. Does the patient appear to be well? Yes, he does. Then what you need to do is monitor your patient regularly. So what that means is that you need to be doing a whole blood clotting time every second hour for 12 hours and then for the next 12 hours you need to be doing that every four hours. If the clotting changes and becomes non-clotting then you follow this line down, we're back in a treatment box and you give the appropriate dose of antivenom. If the patient remains well and the clotting does not become abnormal, then we just watch for 24 hours, the patient remains stable, remains normal clotting, and we can send the patient home at that stage. Now if we do know what the snake is, so we're going back up to the top here, if we do know what the snake is, but we, it's not a Russell's Viper, the next question is, is it a cobra? Okay, yes it is a cobra. The next question is, are there signs of developing paralysis? and we've been through what those signs are, yes they are, then we start treatment and we give the appropriate dose of Cobra antivenom which is, you all know, four vials of antivenom. If we know it is a Cobra but there is no neurotoxicity, then we re-examine the patient half hourly. If paralysis signs develop, Yes, they do. We are back in a treatment box and we give the appropriate dose of antivenom, which is four vials of Cobra antivenom. If these serial examinations stay normal, so no, and no, um, where are we? No paralysis signs, then we continue to assess for neurotoxicity every half an hour for the first 12 hours and then hourly for the second 12 hours. Now if we do know what the snake is, but it is not a Russell's Viper and not a Cobra, the next question is, is it a crate? Now if it, yes, it is a crate, then we need to observe, do serial neurological assessments, and if neurotoxicity develops, then we need to support the airway and ventilate the patient, but there is no antivenom available for that. If it's, we know what the snake is, it's not a Cobra, it's not a crate, the question, next question is, is it a green snake? Yes it is, then the advice here is that we monitor the clotting time and the renal function because we know that a green snake will cause a coagulopathy but should not cause an abnormality in the renal function. If the renal function does start to deteriorate then you should think am I right, is this really a green snake? Maybe it actually is a Russell's Viper and I should think about giving Russell's Viper antivenom. Now some of your patients will not know what snake bit them. And if that's the case, then you are on this side of the algorithm. This is the patient that came in and says, look, something bit me, it was very dark, I didn't see it, I don't know what it was. 
Now here, the first thing you need to do is see if there is neurotoxicity. And the reason for that is that, not because cobra is a more common snake bite, but because neurotoxicity will kill your patient faster than coagulopathy and renal failure. So the first thing you must do from a clinical point of view is see whether there is neurotoxicity suggestive of a cobra or crate bite. If your patient does have signs of neurotoxicity, at this stage we don't know if it's cobra or crate, but we do know the only one that we can treat is cobra. So we give cobra antivenom here. If there is no neurotoxicity, then the next question is, what is the patient's clotting ability? So you do a whole blood clotting time. And if the blood is non-clotting, or the patient develops shock and becomes unwell, then the most common snake in your country that causes that obviously is Russell's viper, and you should treat that by giving eight vials of antivenom. If the blood is normal, it's clotting, and the patient is not shocked, then you're in a situation where you need to monitor the patient both for the developing neurotoxicity, which might suggest cobra or crate, and for abnormal development of abnormal clotting, which might suggest Russell's viper. If the patient, you do that and the patient develops paralysis, you give cobra. If you do that and the patient develops a clotting abnormality, you give Russell's viper antivenom. Now, I hope that makes sense. Um, the, the idea is just to follow those decision-making points through the diagram. And if you do that, I think in the vast majority of the patients presenting to your institutions, it will help you with the decision-making around what type of snake this patient might have been bitten by and whether or not you should be giving the patient antivenom. As has been mentioned before, this is a guideline that will help managing most patients. It is not a um, prescription for treatment of every patient you will see. So this is a decision-making tool rather than the answer to every single one of your questions, but it, it should help um, in, the most, in most of the patients that you will see. Are there any questions around this before I move on? Because this is probably quite an important part of the, the booklet. Might take a little time to absorb all of those arrows and boxes. If you do think of anything, we'll be here at the end. Now the next page, this is the third page in your booklet there, is a protocol for how to give antivenom. So in this situation, the red box at the top there, you've already decided that the patient needs antivenom because you followed the protocol on the page before. Um, and you've chosen an appropriate antivenom using the protocol on the page before. Um, then you need to have a look at the antivenom and make sure that it's in date and, and looks good. You need to have an IV line in place, obviously. Um, and you need to start the infusion slowly. And most patients will tolerate this well. Um, does the patient develop a reaction? No, most of your patients will tolerate the antivenom quite well and not develop a reaction, in which case you speed it up and you try and get the whole dose in within 20 minutes um, and continue to manage your patient as you otherwise clinically would. Some of your patients will develop a acute reaction to the antivenom. We know there are two types, there are the pyrogenic reactions and the allergic reactions. If that does happen, then you're in this situation, you come over to this box. Here we've said, look, is it a, a mild reaction? Is it just a fever and a rash? Or is it a severe reaction with hypotension and some evidence of anaphylaxis? If it's a mild reaction, you can continue the antivenom and watch and see what happens. Um, if it settles down and doesn't become any worse, then you can speed up and give it over 20 minutes. If it gets worse, then you're up in this box. In the severe box, you need to stop the antivenom infusion, you need to give adrenaline and resuscitate your patient. In which case, one or two things will happen. Your patient will either recover, yes he does, or he will not recover. If the patient doesn't recover, you can't give any more of the antivenom, your patient is having a severe reaction to it. If the patient does recover, you can restart the antivenom and then complete the infusion. At the bottom of the page there, there's some additional prompts to give guidance to things such as an approach to first aid, 
the delivery of emergency care, a reminder of what the signs of developing neurotoxicity are, how to do run a 20 minute whole blood clotting time and the indications for anti-venom. Are there any questions about the anti-venom administration protocol? No, just a decision making tool and aid to how to start the infusion and monitor for adverse events and what to happen, what to do if they occur. Sorry. Yes. I'd like to ask, how fast should the infusion be given? Is it drop by drop or is it the whole lot within 10, 20 minutes? Well, the aim is to infuse the whole volume within 20 Eight minutes. Vials. Eight vials within 20 minutes. About 20 minutes. Yes. We should start at a slower rate than that though. Um, so maybe you start it at a rate that might, if you continue, finish it over an hour. See what happens over those first few minutes. But if nothing happens, then yes, over 20 minutes you want the whole volume in. Mm. And if it takes 25 minutes or 30 minutes, that's not a big deal. No. no. The time is a guide, it's not an absolute. No, that's right. No one will be watching with a stopwatch. Oh. <laughs> Any other questions? No? Okay. So the final page in the booklet at the top has some photos of common snakes. Now there are hundreds of snakes in Myanmar, many of which may be poisonous, but we can't give you photos of hundreds of snakes and it's not a particularly useful thing to do that. So what we have done is just give photos of the four main groups of snakes that we think are likely to cause the vast majority of problems here. And the reason that we have done that is to give you a little visual tool to give to the patient. Say, so, look, was it this snake that bit you? Was it this snake that bit you? Was it this snake that bit you? And this might help um, clarify the exposure that your patient has had. Now the boxes, the points below this, one through to 22, we probably don't need to go through in detail, but what they are is just a list of things for you to think about whilst you're seeing and assessing a patient with snake bite. Some of the key decision points um, that may come up. Um, there is another box at the bottom here. Important things to record in the case notes while the patient is in your hospital. Obviously you need to record what eventually happened to the patient. Did they better, get better and go home? Did they sign and leave the hospital? Did they die in hospital? Um, if they develop renal failure, we need to know what treatments were used, or you need to know and record what treatments were used and what the outcomes of those were, how many haemodialysis sessions the patient had, for example. Um, if they develop other medical problems, you need to record what was done about them. Um, and you need to, in your notes, have a way of recording any investigations you do. And for most importantly, this is the whole blood clotting time. We really, you need to come up with a system that allows you to record the time that you're running a whole blood clotting time and what the result of that test is. Um, additionally, if you're doing other tests in a facility that has access to them, like a urea or a creatinine, it's obviously important to record those results in the notes as well. Now the other document um, of relevance in the folder is this snake bite referral letter. Now one of the problems it seems um, in the system in Mandalay is making available information from hospitals that a patient has been to before they get here. Some referral letters are, are very good uh, and have all the information required. Um, but there is a great deal of variability in terms of what is recorded in those referral letters. Um, and this is an attempt to make sure that everybody who's referring a patient here is including in that referral the information that is critical to the doctor receiving the patient. And would very strongly encourage those of you who are working in township hospitals elsewhere and transferring patients to this hospital to use this letter and send it with the patient. Um, if you, you're free to photocopy them and make as many of them as you want, or if you want us to photocopy them, um, then contact Indian Chit and she'll let us know and we can print more and get them distributed to you. 
Um, sorry, Chenna, you have sorry, a point? Sam, <coughs> there's one point that uh, uh, I, I have just uh, had a chance to review this uh, a few hours ago, uh, talking to Matt, Matt Chen, and there's one issue that is lacking in this. This is version number one. We'll provide you with version number two very quickly. In the other treatments used, please remember to record how much IV fluid was given in your healthcare facility. Without that knowledge, every time the patient goes up the next level of healthcare facility, there is a tendency to give more IV fluids so that by the time they come to Mendeley General Hospital, they could have received anything up to 8 to 10 liters, and no wonder the patient is at great danger of acute tumor edema. So in the art treatments use, we will modify it to actually ask has the patient received IVT, and if so, what is it saline or microcentral dextrose, and how many liters in the time the patient has spent with you? So we will improve this referral form. And the other comment is at this point, if I may, is that please provide feedback to us. Nothing we have presented is set in stone. We would like to hear from you in the next few weeks and in the next few months. Please contact either myself or Nian Su Cho or Nian Nian Chit, and then we will improve the forms for you uh, in the next few months. Mm. Yeah, these um, documents have been in a process of constant evolution really for 18 months now and will probably continue to be evolved as we get feedback from people who are using them, so the I agree. Other, uh, sorry, one other thing, we also need to ask the question, what was the indication, what were the indications for giving antivenom? And at the moment, that is not covered. No, the, 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 those points are however spelt out on page one of the guide to assessment. Mm -hmm. So the sorts of information that you should be recording, including what fluids you've used and whether you gave a diuretic or not, is prompted here. So all of these points, um, including what type of antivenom, what time it was given, etc., are in this part of the document and definitely, as Chen has pointed, are, are very relevant, vital bits of information to record uh, in the treatment section here. Because the quality of care that could be provided by the next team of doctors is totally reliant on what you tell them because the patient is either too sick or they may not be well enough to tell the next team of doctors. Mm. So just to walk through this quickly, what we are after is where you, the patient is coming from, what date, who sent them, what the patient's name is, date of birth. Now I understand date of birth is a problem, lots of people don't know, you can put age there and that may well be something that we modify as well in the next form. What gender they are, where they live or, the, or their nearest village um, would be adequate there. What date and time and the nearest village the bite occurred at, what type of snake it was and where the patient was bitten, um, was the snake brought into hospital and seen or not, um, did the patient get first aid and what was it, did the patient get any traditional treatments and what was it, what time and date did they turn up at your health facility. Um, and then there is a section asking you to put down what your clinical assessment is. Now general symptoms means things like nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, limb pain, etc. So if these things are there, you pre present and you can describe what the finding was over here. Um, we ask you then to, to look for local bite site effects and swelling. Are they there or not? Present or absent? Evidence of bleeding? Is it? present or absent. If it's present, describe what it is in this section of the form over here. Um, is there edema? And if there is, where is it? Is it conjunctival? Is it pulmonary? Is it other? Then describe what you have observed over here. Um, is there evidence of paralysis, absent or present? And if you've found it, describe what you have seen over here. What is the urine output? Sometimes you're not going to know what the urine output is because the patient's only been with you for six hours and they haven't weed yet. So that's fine. You say, well, it's not yet apparent. Um, if they've been here for some time, it's either normal or abnormal. There's a box here asking you to record the results of whole blood clotting times. Um, when you did it and what the result was, clotting or non-clotting. We then ask, what treatment was given? Was antivenom given, yes or no? What type, MPF or other? If it's other, write what it was there. 
the date and the time and the number of vials, other treatments used, and as Chen has pointed out, the things that we are crucially interested in, fluids, diuretics. Additionally, you know, if you've given steroids or antibiotics or an antihistamine, this is the place to record what you've done there. And this will avoid patients getting double dosed with things they don't need. It will avoid them getting iatrogenic pulmonary edema because we've filled them up with too many fluids. Um, if we ask a, a brief comment about what the response has been, you know, the blood pressure got better or it didn't get better, for example, and why you're transferring the patient because they're becoming oliuric or they've got persistent shock or they're developing capillary leak syndrome and pulmonary edema. Is this clear? Yeah? Okay. Would you like to have the bite size? I mean, blood pressure, fast rate? Well, it's a, it's a little bit of a balance between trying to get good information um, transmitted and making too much work for the doctor at the other end. Um, at, because what we don't want is to create a form that is so complicated that nobody ever uses it. Yeah, okay, well we can easily put a section yeah, in there so for like vital signs. The vital sure. Signs. The, the, what we have to bear in mind is that the current referral letter <coughs> that comes doesn't say anything clinical in it. So this is an enormous improvement on that, but trying to keep it within um, the bounds of practicality for someone who's a um, maybe the, the lone doctor on in a small station hospital or whatever, they've got limited time, limited resources. So it, it is a balancing act, as Sam has said, between what we'd like to have and what it's practical to collect. But I think uh, it's, it's also important to recognise, yes, yes the, the quality of the referral letters I've looked at uh, varies. Some uh, average, some very good. But I think uh, we should take on board her suggestion of vital signs. Sure. Uh, it's not... Uh, it's, that's easy to add. Yeah, we can put that in. Okay. Just to um, recap then, the, the intention here is um, not to tell you all how to manage snake bite. What the intention with these documents is, is to make sure that everybody has the same tools available to them. You know, clinicians in your country have gone to a lot of work, done a lot of research to develop a protocol for management of snake bite in this country. Um, what we should do is make sure that every doctor who is managing snake bite in the country actually has this protocol. Um, so that is the, the main thrust of what we are trying to do here. Make good clinical um, decision making tools um, available to every doctor who sees snake bite. Um, and in that way we can try and make sure that snake bite is being consistently managed by everybody throughout the region and that good data is being recorded and transmitted within the health system. Once we've done these things then we can all have a, a sensible look at, at what is happening because care is standardised, there's good data being recorded um, and then we can work out which components of this protocol work well and which components of this protocol maybe don't work so well. Okay. The aim, obviously, of all of these things is to improve the patient outcomes uh, post snake bite in Myanmar. So, does anybody have any questions about what you've been provided with or how to get more of them? Okay. Thank you for the presentation. My question is to answer about the first Yep. You mentioned that observation, how many times yep. observation hit it? No, you don't no. need to because there is no information to guide that decision. But once we have started doing this, if we see that patients who've been bitten two and three times have worse outcomes than patients who are only bitten once, then that might change. But if we don't record that information, we will never know. Mm. And that one is I'm sure the 
No, I'm not. That is uh, an omission. So if a patient has been bitten by a snake or has any penetrating wound, they should have, you should make sure their tetanus status is up to, state, up to date. So no, there's no difference between the two. We have just mm. accidentally left it out of one box.